the Hollywood Radio Theater. Every day at this time, Monday through Friday, a J.M. Kohler's Enterprises production, the Hollywood Radio Theater presents an unusual tale of mystery and suspense. Every week, Monday through Friday, the Hollywood Radio Theater presents... I'm Rod Serling. You're listening to the Zero Hour. Rest your eyes. Exercise your mind. This week, Stanton for a footprint of But I wouldn't want to die there. Starring Neil Persaud. Brock Peters. Marge Redmond. In Elliot Lewis's production of The Zero Hour. Never put together a jigsaw puzzle. Begin with the pieces that have a flat edge. They form your perimeter, the frame. From there, work inward, turning each piece to examine all possible angles. A good puzzle has several pieces cut to nearly identical shapes. This checking and counter-checking is tedious work. But soon things begin to fall into place. You begin to get the picture. Whole sections fill in. Until you've only the last few pieces remaining. This week's tale is a real puzzler. A story within a story. A winter's tale of summer past. Come to the Caribbean islands. Visit exotic St. Martin's say the brochures. Where it's summer all year round. Quite a temptation if you're spending January in New York City like Sylvia Bennett. But she's already been to St. Martin. And one visit was enough. She could never go back. Not after what happened. Though even now those last pieces don't quite fit... But that was over. Much has happened to her since. The decree finalizing her divorce, a new job, a new apartment. And now her mind was made up. For Sylvia Bennett, New York in January was perfect. For suicide. For Sylvia Bennett, St. Martin is a nice place to visit. But I wouldn't want to die there. Our story begins after this word. Picture this. Snow is falling on Manhattan. January thaw is late in coming. A yellow taxi spins around the corner at 103rd and West End and settles to a stop astride a brown snowbank piled high in the A woman steps from the passenger side out into the ice and slush. A handsome woman of 42. Her expression is not bitter. A gust of wind off the Hudson River swirls the virgin snow into her determined face as she struggles her way indoors. Oh, New York, I despise you so. I must leave instructions. If found, please ship in a plain pine box to anywhere far away. Regards, Sylvia Bennett, deceased. Damn, you're so slow. The mail. Why not? Let's see what bills my state will have to pay. Con Ed, Lord and Taylor, telephone company. What, what on earth? Postage due, 14 cents? Set, Saint Martin? More travel guides? Oh, uh, no more trips for Sylvia. No more bills. No more of this hideous planet. And this time... And this time, no slip-ups. Damn it. They'll have to break the door down to get me out. There. Next step. Good, stiff belt of scotch. Right here on the living room rug? Nope, too messy. 
A bullet in the brain. No gun. A window. Hmm. With my luck, I'd land in the snow, break my back, and live. God, it's quiet. I wonder. All these pages. Dear Sylvia, don't throw this away, please. The way I look at it, you owe it to me to read it. I spend a lot of time writing it down, and the least you can do is read it. I deliberately didn't see the papers when it was all over. I suppose I should have, but I just didn't want to see what they said about us. That's the kind of coward I am, but then you know that. <laughs> Can't you people let a wretch die in peace? Hello. Hi, it's Carl. I know, I recognized your voice. How have you been? How's the new job? Ghastly, thank you to both questions. You didn't have to leave Day, you know. Divorced people do work together. It is done. But Day is your magazine. I'm just a reporter, remember? I'm worried about you, Sylvia. You, you won't do anything foolish. I'm a big girl now. And I'll thank you to mind your own business. Now, hold it. What the hell's wrong with you, anyway? You were getting along all right. We could at least be civilized. And then, ever since you got back from that island, the past six months, you've been... What happened? Do you need money? I told you before, I don't want your money. Sylvia, are you... No, I'm not crying. It's just this... This damn cold. Look, nothing happened. I just got sick in the gut, that's all, of everything. If you need someone to talk to... No, thank you, doctor. These four walls will suffice. They listen rather well, you know. I've nothing more to say to you, Carl. Goodbye. There. No more interruptions. You've written a novel... Oh, a terrible handwriting. Tad, what the devil have you done? Oh, dear Sylvia. No, 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 that's the kind of coward I am, but then you know that. I had to set things straight. You'll forgive me if I don't have much faith in newspapers and magazines. But set it straight to whom? People wouldn't believe me anyway. That's when I thought of you. That's one of the times I thought of you. Anyway, I've told it. The best I can. I start with that day last summer when all hell broke loose on San Martin. I was taking my evening walk along the beach. It was a dark night, though once the sun goes down, all nights are dark to me. I don't see that without my glasses. I should say I hardly see it all. I'm a congenital myopic anyway. Since I've covered that ground so many times, out where the pier juts out, along Molly Smith Point, I knew where I was. What I didn't know was what I would find. A body. A woman's body. Hello? Who? You there. Are you hurt? I... Oh, my God. Oh, Mr. Cobb, I found there's a woman here. I just fell over her, I think. What wants the famous actress, Mr. Cobb? She looks bad. I can hear this all smashed up. Is it Miss Lee? Mr. Cobb, where are you going? He's left from the river. Cobb, what do you do? Sound like you hurt. No, no, I'm all right, Wong. Shine your torch over here. Oh, my God. Well, Mrs. Lee, she looks dead, Mr. Cobb. Who's it? Inspector Clark? Is that you? Cal Wallander here. It's Annabelle Lee, the actress. She's been badly hurt. We we're about to call you. She may be. She's dead. Dead. Very. She's up. What is up? Count the tracks here. See? We are all standing in our own. I'm afraid I can't see what you say. You see, my glass. There are no other tracks, not even her own. What about the tide, Inspector? Couldn't it have washed them away? Monsieur Cadwallader, the tide is coming in. But then how? What could have happened? At the moment, Monsieur, who's to say? But I believe, I am not certain you understand, but I believe that Madame Lee was dotted about the head with some variety of very obstinate material. That is, you, you, you mean on purpose? Uh, one cannot say for certain just yet, Monsieur Cadwallader. May we... It appears that Madame Lee was murdered. It took 
took me a long time to fall asleep that night. I couldn't get that terrible image out of my mind. To quote Poe as best I can, the beautiful Annabel Lee in her sepulcher there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea, lying there in the surf in her white bathing suit, her head, oh, a terrible sight, awful. I keep a supply of very potent sleeping pills on hand for just such emergencies. I took three that night, which was more than I'd used for since the days when... Well, but Sylvia, you must know what day, what years I refer to. I needed the pills then to survive. This time I hoped if I slept deeply, I would awaken to find it was all just a bad dream. Lord knows how long Eloise Almeida was knocking, trying to rouse me before I stirred. Eloise! Uh, what's the matter? The gendarmes, Monsieur Katz. The gendarmes are here. Oh, yes. Yes, Eloise. Uh, tell them I'll be right down. The lounge was nearly deserted. Inspector Leclerc was waiting for me. With him was a certain Captain Dubois who looked very official indeed. They were accompanied by Gerard Bonaventure, a diminutive fellow with big owl eyes and big round glasses. Gerard was owner and editor of the Island Voice in Saint Martin's only newspaper. Do you know yet was she murdered? Even now, Doctor Fortier is conducting his post mortem. Have you been able to reach her husband? The guests in the house, Bates, I believe, is their name, have sent a cable to Puerto Rico. They are trying to reach Mister Lee by telephone as well. There is no Mister Lee. You see, that was her stage name. His name is Tolliver, Robert Tolliver, very big in New York advertising. A genius, I read somewhere. He sold his business last year and retired. Excuse me, Mr. Card. Eloise say you need new handles on two windows. You drive me to Marigot for them? Yes, as soon as these gentlemen are through, Alphonse. For the moment, we are through. Fini. Your presence will be required should we have an inquest. I understand. Come, I'll show you out. If I can help in any way, I'll be here, of course. And, Gerard, you will spell my name correctly. Two L's. Do not worry. I have all that you say right here, Mr. Cad. I must admit, I admire Alphonse's nerve as a passenger, the way people drive on San Martin and the roads between the potholes in the grade and the livestock crossing at will. It's a virtual obstacle course. And I must remind you that my eyesight isn't all that it could be. If Alphonse was frightened, he camouflaged it well. When is Mr. Marsh returning? Watch out, Mr. Cat. How close is Mr. Hayes? Mr. Marsh will be surprised that he missed all the excitement. Get one, Mr. Marsh. Max told me at the airport he'd be back by the end of the week. He had to order some new mattresses and... Look out for that dog, Mr. Cat. I'm sure Max will spend a couple of days living it up. You know how he is. Yes. Mr. Max likes the ladies, eh? You handle the business while he plays. I wouldn't say that exactly, Alphonse. Max is just, uh, well, you know, women prefer a man with a beard to a fat old fogey like me. Oh, oh you're not fat, Mr. Card. You just have a lot of skin. <laughs> Thank you, Alphonse. You put that rather well. Uh, Mr. Mr. Card... Mistress Lee promised me a present, but she never gave it to me. A yellow wig with long curls for the carnival next year. You ask Mr. Tolliver about it when he gets home. Not right away. Wait until after the funeral. I'm sure he'll give it to you. But why can't I ask Mr. Robert for the wig right away, Mr. Card? Well, he'll be very upset about his wife's death. He'll be very, very sad for a while. Oh, I don't think so, Mr. Card. He used to hit Mistress Lee real good. Make her cry, make her eye black all the time. What? Did you tell that to the gendarmes? The gendarmes? Of course not, Mr. Cat. They didn't ask me. Lunch was being served on the terrace when Gerard Bonaventure stopped by looking very excited. Dubois and Leclerc are questioning all over town, going door to door. They think now it was done in a boat, that she was pushed over this side into the water. Why in a boat? 
Because of the tide and lack of footprints. Dr. Fortier has determined the time of date between noon and early evening. That's a lot of time. Couldn't he do better than that? It seems to me it had to happen at night. Surely someone would have seen her get into a boat in broad daylight. It is strange. No one saw her all afternoon. The American couple, Bates, uh, they were in Philipsburg all day shopping, and Maria Lisa, the maid, she was at the dentist for her teeth that are not so good. Uh, they all come back to an empty house. But I think somebody must have seen. That was a very good-looking woman. The gendarme will find out nothing from the people. I think you're right. No one wants to get involved. I shall go to each house, too. This is the mark of a professional reporter. Yes, the people here are my friends. They will tell you how more than they tell the gendarme. I went to bed early that night. You may not believe this, Sylvia, but I had a dream that a lovely woman would soon enter my life. I took my coffee on the gallery the next morning. Across the street, I could see the gendarme's jeep parked in front of Annabelle Lee's house. I wonder who could be coming to Grand Case in a taxi. It's a woman, Mr. Card. She's coming here. Undoubtedly an American. Pretty woman, too. Oh, she sure knows how to walk. I'll say that. Well, I have to go now, Mr. Card. I'll see you later. Mrs. Card, there's a lady here who wants a room. Very well, Eloise. I'll be right down. Poor cat. I had you charmed before I ever saw you. She knows how to walk. That's a laugh. Oh, if things had only been like they seemed to you. Had I come to get away from it all, like I told you. But that wasn't the reason. It wasn't all a lie, though. I did come over from St. Croix. Carl and I were as good as divorced. He was vacationing in Christiansted. I knew the hotel. We'd been there often enough as husband and wife. <laughs> I kept telling myself I wasn't chasing him. We were all sitting together at poolside. Carl, those three vacant but beautiful young women, and good old Sylvia, when we heard the news. Sylvia, you knew Annabelle Lee. Hmm, I interviewed her a couple of times. I've got a terrific idea. Sam Martin's an exile on down. Get on a plane and see what you can find out. The innocent tourist bit. Try to find a spot to stay in the village where it happened. I don't know why I took the assignment. Perhaps to convince Carl that I was better than those stupid women. Those cheerleaders. All bust and no brain. So, I knew how to walk. What next, Cad? I decided to go down, down onto the beach. I didn't do that often, not at midday. My new guest was there. You, Sylvia. Wearing a red low-cut swimsuit and white bracelets that sparkle in the sun. Are you going to sleep, or would you like some company? I'd welcome company. Mrs. Benedict? Oh, Sylvia. This is my first visit to San Martin, and I don't know a soul. Well, I'm Jeffrey Stamp Codwallado. Oh, my, that's a mouthful. People call me Cat. It's an odd name of endearment. I've gotten used to it. <laughs> <laughs> Those are pretty bracelets you have. Oh, thank you. <laughs> they're they're uh, turquoise. Rather common these days. They used to be chic. Who is over there? Annabelle Lee. I should amend that. She lived there once. The actress? Oh, didn't I hear somewhere that she passed away? As a matter of fact, I found her right over there by the pier. Terrible thing. You know, you've got the prettiest place on the beach. Mm. How did you find it? My partner, Max Terry, found it. I can't take credit. Your partner? Yes, he's a very nice man. You're sure to meet him. He's due back from Puerto Rico any day. Mm. How would you like to have lunch with me? Oh, I'm so sorry. I've already eaten. Oh, I ordered a cab to take me over to Phillipsburg to do some shopping. Well, then how about uh, cocktails, dinner? Oh, I'd like that. Say about six. About six. Poor Cad. You were even more blind than you imagined. And I was so ruthless. Oh, I went to Phillipsburg that afternoon, all right. But not to shop. I went to the telegraph office and wired St. Croix asking for information. Somehow, I was perplexed. 
looked frightened by a big teddy bear of a man with thick glasses. He reminded me of someone. A face in the newspaper. And the name, Max Terry. Suddenly, while looking at my own reflection in those tinted eyeglasses before leaving the beach, the names and faces crossed a span of 25 years. I was fresh out of journalism school. My first assignment, a murder case. Helen Terry, 14 years old, pushed to her death off the rooftop of her family in Queens. She had a brother, Maxwell, in his middle 20s. And he had a friend. A heavy-set, myopic friend who was found guilty as charged. But the other name, not Cadwallader, but Johns. Joseph Johns. Oh, Cad, I had to do it. Please forgive me. Tomorrow at this time, rest your eyes. And listen here to this week's continuing study in suspense. But I wouldn't want to die there. I'm Rod Serling, and this is The Zoo. You've been listening to the Hollywood Radio Theater's presentation of The Zero Hour, heard every weekday at this time. Rod Serling is your host. Stanton Forbes, but I wouldn't want to die there, was adapted for radio by Kim Weisskopf. Nehemiah Persoff is Cat. Brock Peters is Leclerc. And Marge Redmond is Sylvia. Featured in the cast are Herbert Rudley, Jester Hairston, Mady Norman, and Victor Bozeman. Zero Hour is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Jack Myers is executive producer. Rochelle Sherman, associate producer. And Kim Weisskopf, story editor. Music conducted by Stanley D. Hoffman. The Hollywood Radio Theater theme was played by Ferranti and Teicher and is now available on United Artists Records and Tapes. This has been a J.M. Colas Enterprises production. Hugh Douglas speaking. Tune in tomorrow and once again, rest your eyes and listen here to The Zero Hour. here next week as Lloyd Mercer on Hollywood Radio Theater's brand new Zero Hour. Mercer is a deep down politician of the old school. We've received some new information on the Henley murder. It points rather definitely towards your culpability. Apparently there was an eyewitness. Someone saw me kill Henley? Please listen to George Maharis, Charles McGraw and me next week when the Zero Hour presents Dead Man's Tale.
I'm Rod Serling. You're listening to The Zero Hour. Rest your eyes. Exercise your opinion. This week, Stanton Forbes a print of tropical intrigue. But I wouldn't want to die there. Starring Neil A. Kursoff. And Brock Peters. And Marge Redmond. In Elliot Lewis's production of The Zero Hour. Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Zero Hour. Sponsored in part by Chevrolet Trucks, Cold Power, and Sign Off. This is The Zero Hour on Mutual Radio. There's something relentless about a jigsaw puzzle. Once it's begun, it dares you to continue. It has a gluttonous effect on time, altering, consuming the very hands of the clock. For Sylvia Bennett, time has become a precious commodity. She has selected this day to be her last, and the puzzle is what she needs the very least. It came in the mail, a letter, or rather a manuscript, from a man named Cadwallader, or perhaps Joseph Johns. It's a puzzle of intrigue with borders of tropical green and deep Caribbean blue. What may be a boat we have forming in one dark corner, and beneath that the scarlet tinge of a beautiful woman spilled life's blood. The picture is murder. The puzzle begun. And somewhere hidden within the remaining irregular shapes lie the pieces that will form a face. That face is the key, for it is the face of a killer. But I wouldn't want to die there. It continues after this word. There's a guy in this neighborhood practically everybody knows. He's a pusher. And his big deal is heroin. Now, that's a billion-dollar business run by people who don't care about you or your kids. Only money. And it's supported by addicts who need 40 bucks a day to get their fix. So, you get mugged or robbed or worse. Fix the pusher. Call the National Heroin Hotline, 800-368-5363. You don't have to give any information about yourself. Only room, a place, a license plate, a description. Anything specific. Fix the pusher. Call the Heroin Hotline in Washington, D.C. It's a free call from anywhere in this country. Dial information if you forget the number. It's 800 800- 368-5363. It's run by the federal government. 800-368-5363. The morning of the second day. The sun was setting behind Molly Smith Point. It seemed particularly brilliant. Hot orange, pink, pink and gold. We watched it set. So sky and sea turn to shades of purple. Remember, I studied you, Sylvia. You were lovely as a painting. Cadwallader. That's an unusual name. I've heard it somewhere. One of Salinger's people? (laughs) How do you like Alfonso's special concoction? We call it no big thing. Somewhat of a misnomer. I'm afraid it's rather potent. No, that was Stradladder or something. Tell me about your ex-husband. Touché. Shall we be friends? (laughs) Tell me, Mr. Cad. What do you hate? Personally, I detest accordion. So do I. And more eels. Bad grammar. Pretty men. Too, too elegant women. Women who... uh, No, 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 no. People who talk too much. Liars. I hate liars. (laughs) Unless there's a good reason, and they do it well. Hey, Cad! I'm back! What the hell's been going on? Who's that? That's Max, the brains of the outfit. I'll introduce you. Max, I'd like you to meet Mrs. Sylvia Bennett. She's taking a room with us. How do you do? How do you do? Can't I leave you alone for a couple of days without the sky falling, chicken little? 
It's all over the San Juan papers. Annabelle Lee, dead. Yes, I found her. Uh, excuse me, I have to go to the ladies' room. You feeling all right? I'm fine. It's no big thing. Ken, now listen, there were reporters on the plane back. You know what this will mean. We'll probably do a booming business. You know what I'm talking about. Max, you just got back. You're tired. Maybe you should rest a while. Ken, wait, I've got to talk to Later, you. Later, I've got a date for dinner. Eloise, have you seen Mrs. Bennett? She is out on the terrace, Monsieur Cad. She asked me where you are and could I bring two more no big things. I bring them now? Very good, Eloise. Thank you. Monsieur Robert is outside, too. Annabelle Lee's husband? We. Oui. I want to see you, Cadwallader. Mr. Tolliver, I didn't expect to see you so soon. Uh, please let me offer my condolences. Never mind that. I want some straight information on what happened to Annabelle, and I want it now. I'm sorry, but someone is waiting for me on the... They can wait. I'm afraid they can. Look, I'm sick and tired of getting the runaround. Just what the hell do you mean, Tolliver? You've got a lot of nerve barging in here, shooting off your mouth that way. I mean Cadwallader found my wife. I got some fairy tale from a French cop about your friend out beach walking. Well, he's going to have to do better than that. Look, I I'll be glad to answer any questions. Cad, you don't have to put up with this garbage. Poor off, Max. Everybody's all wound up. I'd like to hear what Mr. Tolliver has to say. I got plenty to say. For openers, I think you were making it with Annabelle. Or trying to. She wouldn't put out, so you clobbered her. Wait a minute. Hold it, Max. I don't want him in here. Take it easy. Take it easy. He's wrong. Now, look, you're wrong. I, I've only spoken to the lady when you've both come in for dinner. Besides, why should she be interested in a fat old man like me? Because Annabelle was interested in anything that wore pants. Not only that, she complained about a peeping Tom, she said. When she was getting dressed or sunbathing. Somebody's nasty, she told me. Somebody's got a fouled up mind. Well, Cadwallader, I think that somebody is you. And I suppose you didn't beat her to a pulp every Sunday and twice on holiday. You can't talk to me Sit like... Sit down, man! Shut up, Cad! I was in San Juan. San Juan isn't the other side of the world. You ever hear of chartering a boat? A plane, maybe? Oh, how about a hitman? Goodbye, lady. Hello, fat bankroll. How do you like that picture, Tolliver? Uh, you son of a... Hey, you Enough, enough. Let's look, let's look. The house of Tolliver should eat his dinner at home. The cuisine of the gendarmerie is not so good. I'm going. But I'm not satisfied, Cadwallader. You're going to have to come up with a better story. I've got ways of finding out what really went on. The moment our hostile guest was escorted out, I went to find Sylvia, but the terrace was deserted. I cursed my bad luck and Tolliver's bad timing and began nursing my third no big thing. Somebody slipped out from the shadows behind me and breathed in my ear. Is it all right, Mr. Card? I go for the gendarmes. Did I do right? Oh, how fun. Oh, Cad, you couldn't have known what I was really up to that night. The drinks had gone to my head, but not to the point my hearing was impaired. I stayed until the police arrived, then crept off to my room. I wanted to fall asleep, to shut off my memory, but I couldn't. John's and Terry, together. I hadn't remembered Max Terry as being such a brute, an angry, hairy gorilla of a man. And the coincidence that I should have come to Saint Martin to research another murder. I don't know how long I lay there in bed, not listening, but hearing things. Hello? Is someone out there? Max Terry, Mrs. Bennett. What do you want? Just checking the cistern, Mrs. Bennett. Anything I can do for you? No. Thank you. Good night, then. They come in different sizes. From small to extra large, our trucks are tough. Of that there is no doubt. Because they're built for lasting value. Day in, day out, they are. And value is what Chevy's all about. In 1973, according to dealers' report deliveries, more Chevy trucks were sold than any other make. 
Come check out our new Chevy trucks, and you'll see the reason why. This is Julia Mead. Today, because of the energy crisis, washing your clothes in cold water makes more sense than ever. You see, the more cold water you use, the more fuel you'll save. Fortunately, we have cold power, the detergent specially formulated to get your clothes clean in cold water. If you use cold power already, you know that your clothes will be clean and bright without hot water wrinkling or stain setting. This is Julia Mead saying let's all start using cold power in cold water today and help keep America out of hot water. Why are you telling me this? Why now? Why today? Oh, I suppose you must. And you're right, I do owe you this much. So, what happened next? The morning, morning of the third the day. day. I overslept, I overslept again, again the next morning. When I went downstairs, there was no one in the dining room except Eloise. And when I asked her where everybody was, she said Mr. Max had gone to buy groceries. The Bings had flown to Saba, a neighboring island, for the day, and Mrs. Bennett had gone to pick up a telegram. Then she told me Rose Phillips wanted to see me. It was urgent. After coffee, I went to see her. What she had to say was more than urgent. Why she chose to tell me, I couldn't figure at first. You see, on Saint Martin, we have what one might call peculiar alliances, loyalties among relatives are inviolable, and since most everyone is related to everyone else, well, Rose Phillips had sworn a solemn oath that she would not tell what she knew to the gendarmes. She left that to me. I drove to Marigo quickly, but carefully. I parked across the street from the main gendarmerie, crossed over, and entered the rather imposing building. Before I had the chance to ask to see Inspector Leclerc, he appeared. It was almost as if he was waiting for me. Leclerc came out through an inner door accompanied by a chubby-faced, stockily built man who was practically trotting. The man looked straight ahead on his way out. He never even saw me. He looked familiar, though I couldn't place him. As I said, I had the feeling the clerk was expecting my arrival. I didn't see him look my way before he spoke. Ah, Monsieur Cadwallet, what brings you to Marigot? Inspector Leclerc, could I speak in private, please, with you? Certainement. Uh, come into my office, won't you? Won't you kindly sit down? What is it I can do for you? Well, I've, I've learned something I think you should know. Yes? Robert Tolliver was back here on the island for a time, the day his wife, Annabel Lee, was killed. Ah, yes, we know. You know? Certainly. One of our first duties was to investigate the whereabouts of Madame Lee's husband and Monsieur Max Terry as well. The gentleman who just left, that was Emmanuel Patterson, the ticket manager from Carrie Bear. Monsieur Patterson has corroborated the report that both Robert Tolliver and Max Terry were passengers on the early flight to San Juan. Monsieur Patterson also reports that Monsieur Tolliver flew back at 3.30 the next day, then left again for San Juan at 5. Customs records agree. That is how we know. I see, yes. Well, I should have realized... Robert Tolliver was driven to his house by Clement Turbo on Turbo's cab. Mr. Tolliver says he came to get a check necessary to consummate a business matter in San Juan that afternoon. We are pursuing this last matter further with the American authorities and the Puerto Rican hotel where Mr. Tolliver was staying. This far, his narrative seems basically valid. No, I just thought... We are also pursuing as a routine matter the corroboration of Max Terry's visit to San Juan. He stays, I believe... At the Primavera? Yes, it's a guest house, not unlike our own in Grand Case. The concierge is a lady friend of Max's. Ah, yes. A Miss Anita Castellano. So you see, Monsieur Cadwallader, we are almost as efficient as your American forces. Yes, of course. Well, sorry to have bothered you. Oh, no, no, no bother at all. When I arrived back at the guest house, there was a young man I'd never seen waiting for me. Perhaps I'd come to possess what one might call look-look voyance. 
I knew not who the man was, but I was sure of why he had come and what he wanted. Mr. Cadwallader, my name is Boland. Joseph Boland. I'm a newspaper man from the States. I wonder if you've got a spare room. I'm afraid... Where the devil is Alphonse? This thing weighs a ton. Well, I'll only be here a few days. Eloise, take this stuff, will you? You're uh, looking for a place to stay? I'm Max Terry. Max, this is Mr. Boland. He's a newspaper man. Oh, over here for the lead business, I imagine. Well, there's a bunch of us on the island, but most of them are holed up in Phillipsburg. I thought if I could find a spot near the scene of the crime... Uh, here, my credentials. Hollywood, eh? Well, the thing is, this could be a big break for me. Hannibal Lee was very famous, you know, especially on the West Coast. You'd be doing me a tremendous favor if you put me up. Don't see why not. Do you, Cat? Well, let me take your bag, Mr. Bowen. I don't know if it's such a good idea to have a newspaper man staying here. Do you, Mr. Cat? Oh, I guess there's no harm in it. Let me help you with those, Eloise. Well, I don't know about harm, but he could find out a lot of things about Grand Case that maybe we'd like it better if he didn't. That's all I was thinking about, Monsieur Cad. That is all. Listen. Headache pain is one thing. A sinus headache is something else. You feel it behind the eyes, under the cheekbones. Sometimes your whole face can seem to throb with pain. You want relief. Take Sinoff tablets. S-I-N-E-O-F-F. -F, the sinus medicine that gives you a full dose of pure aspirin. Plus a sinus drainer that helps relieve sinus pain while you drain. Sinoff tablets. The sinus medicine. And Sinoff doesn't stop there. Have you tried Sinoff Sinus Spray? The fastest known form of sinus congestion relief. It penetrates clogged nasal passages in seconds. That's something. That's Sinoff Sinus Spray. When sinus flares up, use Sinoff tablets and spray, only as directed. Sinoff, S-I-N-E-O-F-F, -F, the sinus medicines in the bright red box. Now, where were we? Let me think. Well, that must have been the day I went shopping. Oh, Phil, you're such a good liar when you want to be. Carl's cable with the lowdown on the Joseph Johns case had come. If this was the same man, if Cad was Johns, if this was another of my million-dollar hunches, Cad, poor teddy bear, I found you in the shade of the front gallery. Hello, Cad. Isn't it a lovely day? Oh, hi there. I missed you at lunch. Care to join me? I heard you went to town. Something about a cable. Oh, Oh, yes, from my ex-husband. Not bad news, I hope. He's bad news. He wanted to come here, so I had to wire back. Dear ex, stop. Don't you dare stop, Sylvia. <laughs> you think you'll get the message? You're not very subtle. No, I don't suppose I am. Who lives over there? That fascinating old house. Madame Busquet and her son. The house is falling apart now, but I understand it used to be magnificent. Oh, look, there she is now. She looks like quite a character. They say she was magnificent, too, in her day. Who's that bald fellow with her? That's her son, Guy. Is there something wrong with him? Yes, he's retarded, not quite bright. There's another boy who lives in Puerto Rico. He's normal. With the father? No, Michel Bosquet lives outside of town. Have you met our newest guest, Mr. Boland? No, I'm afraid I haven't. He must have just arrived. This morning. He's from the States, a reporter. A reporter? Yes, you act surprised. Uh, I'm not surprised. I knew it wouldn't take long. Annabelle Lee was a great star in her day. Won't the publicity hurt the tourists? Maybe, maybe not. But there isn't much I can do about it. Oh, it's such a gorgeous day. Why don't you take me sightseeing before the place is crawling with newspaper people? Well, where do you want to go? Well, the Bings were telling me about a place called Bendinu. Where's that? Oh, beyond Marigot on the peninsula. What's it like? Tell me something about it. Benvenu, it's a very strange place. No one lives there, not a soul. It's just there. It's the unfulfilled dream of an American developer. A few years ago, this American hired a French architect to design the plans for a city that would combine the past and the future, Mediterranean in feeling, with all modern conveniences of the jet age. Construction was begun. 
three four-story buildings, all built of stone, with walkways, courtyards, fountains. And then the money ran out. The crews left. They won't be back until someone invests another fortune. In the meantime, then the new sits and waits, all stone and glass and empty. Sounds lovely. It is in a strange way. Could we go there? Oh, it's a bit of a drive. I don't really trust my eyesight. I'll drive. Very well. We'll take my car. I'll tell Max we're going. Well, I want to get my camera. I'll meet you downstairs. Did you ever? Oh, I never would have dreamed this was here. Ted, stand over this way. No, no, I'll ruin the picture. No, you won't. You handle that camera like a pro. Oh, it's just a hobby. I adore color slides. There's a spectacular view from the top apartment. You can see Marigo and Phillipsburg, both sides of the island. Not Grand Case? No, we're behind the hill. How beautiful it would have been. Oh, won't anyone finish it ever? Maybe one day. If the money man finds another money man. You see, that's what they call him here. The money man. Do you know him? No, his name is Tanqueray. He hasn't been on Saint Martin so far as I know during the six years I've been here. Somehow, I rather like this place. The way it is, the mirage. Do you come here often? Sometimes, when I want to get away. Well, have you seen enough? We'd best be getting back. Business was booming when we returned to Grand Case. You thanked me with a peck on the cheek and went upstairs to change. Considering this was the off-season, the place was really jumping. The Bings were back and had brought another couple with them. Bolin and Gerard occupied one table, and of all people, Robert Tolliver was there. He and the Bates couple comprised a quiet threesome at a corner table. I had my hands full just serving drinks. Hey, Cap Warder, my friend Gerard here has been filling me in on the murder. You found the body, right? How about an exclusive? I'll give you name credit. No, we're rather busy now. All I can tell you is what I told the police. I was out walking and stumbled across her. Think it had anything to do with black unrest? Black unrest? Sure, all these islands. The natives are restless. We hear about it up in the States. Self-government, all that. I wouldn't know anything about that. Talk to Gerard here. He's in this island. I just live here. Alphonse, I need one mint julep, a sling, and two you-know-what. Hey, Chad, come here. I wanted Bolin one. Oh, he's got a race backlash theory he's working on. Why did you rent him the room? He doesn't have to be here. Oh, why so, Chad? These guys can ride anything. At least if he's here, we can try to win him over. Be diplomatic. Thank you, Alphonse. For any of these for Tolliver, I'd like to poison this. Max, be diplomatic. People came and went all through the evening and night. The Tolliver party left early. We got rid of the last around 2 a.m. Max counted up the evening's receipts, slapped me on the back, and went off to bed. I must have sat there alone for a long time. I thought about you, Sylvia, about how pretty you looked that night. And for the first time in years, I I felt felt lonely. I sat alone, too, that night, Cad, up in my room, too busy to be lonely, working late into the night, just hoping you were Joseph John. Oh, Cad, you don't know what lonely is. You have people who care for you, who care about you. They care because you are kind, regardless of what you might have done in the past. I have no past, and I want no part of any future. You are listening to Mutual's presentation of The Zero Hour. Tomorrow at this time, rest your eyes. And listen here to this week's continuing study in suspense. But I wouldn't want to die there. I'm Rod Serling, and this is The Zero Hour. 
Today's episode brought to you in part by Chevrolet Flux Coal Power and Sign Off. This is the Zero Hour on Mutual Radio. You have been listening to The Zero Hour, a presentation of the Mutual Broadcasting System in association with Hollywood Radio Theater. Heard every weekday at this time. Rod Serling is your host. Zero Hour is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The Hollywood Radio Theater theme was played by Ferranti and Teicher and is now available on United Artists Records and Tapes. Hugh Douglas speaking. Tune in tomorrow and once again... Rest your eyes and listen here. To the Zero Hour. This is the Mutual Radio Network. The Hollywood Radio Theater. Every day at this time, Monday through Friday, a J.M. Kohler's Enterprises production, The Hollywood Radio Theater, presents an unusual tale of mystery and suspense. Every week, Monday through Friday, the Hollywood Radio Theater presents... I'm Rod Serling. You're listening to the Zero Hour. Rest your eyes. Exercise your opinions. This week, Stanton Ford looked went the But I wouldn't want to die there. Starring Nehemiah Prasad. Brock Peters. And Marge Redmond. In Elliot Lewis's production of The Zero Hour. There's a saying about too many crooks. The same could apply to a jigsaw puzzle. Too many hands spoil the fun. The puzzle is this. Who killed Annabelle Lee? The St. Martin police want to know. So does the press. The lady's husband thinks he knows. People on the island are wondering about their neighbors, their friends. Reporters from the United States have come asking the same questions, testing the same pieces. Of all those, only Sylvia Bennett is an expert. And an expert at puzzles has from the start the final picture in mind. She has only to assemble the pieces. Or does she? But I wouldn't want to die there. Continues after this word. Oh, what's the effect of it? You scald yourself to death with a coffee. All right, I should be separated from my soul by now. Better, Todd, you're so long-winded. Don't you realize you're expecting this thing? I should be indebted to you for this retreat. Is that it? Well, I'm not. But I read on because I must. Be merciful, please. Be quick about it. The fourth Good morning. morning. A yowl yow like that of an animal awakened me. What on earth? What's that? My specs, where are my glasses? Cat, wait for me! Let me fly! Eloise, has someone been murdered? Let me... Why? Dad, wait! Eloise, what happened? The gendarmes have taken Madame Bousquet's son to the gendarmerie in Maricot. But why? Was that the boy screaming? I'm not certain, but I believe it has something to do with Mr. Flea's death. How could that be? Here comes Alphonse. Maybe he knows. Mr. Card, the gendarmes take away the Bousquet. They put the handcuffs on him and everything. He might have put up a great fight. Did you hear? How could we miss it? But why, Alphonse? Why did they arrest Guy Bousquet? For spying on Mr. Flea's spying. So there really was a peeping Tom. How did they find that out? Someone told them. I do not know who told them, but someone... Someone told them. That's odd. I still don't believe it. Believe what? That horrible noise? Sylvia, they've arrested Guy Bousquet. 
I'd go get coffee, Monsieur Tide. Oh, someone uh, better go get the beans. They're barricaded up in their room. Hell, I was hoping Tolliver did it. I'd love to see that fat cat do time. Who says he didn't? But why have they arrested the boy? It looks like a sex crime. He had the glasses on her. Max, you don't know that for sure. It is true, Mr. Cat. I didn't tell the gendarmes, but I see him too. Lots of people know. There, you see. Oh, let's get some coffee. I can't think straight. I still don't buy it. Thank you, Louise. What's to buy? He's male, isn't he? But they're so sure she was killed in a boat. I've never seen Guy Bousquet go anywhere near the water. He never leaves that porch. I suppose it's possible. Well, of course it's possible. It makes sense. Somebody with scrambled eggs for brains? We don't know that he's mental. Slow, I know, but mentally disturbed. Will there be a trial? Aren't you two being a little quick to judge? Hey, I need a car and fast. Gerard said they'll be taking the kid to Marigold. I hear there's a reporter from Day Magazine on the island. I gotta scoop that guy. Well, Rose Phillips has a car she rents. Thanks. My, my, the intrepid reporter. Well, at least now we can get back to normal. Tolliver will get the hell out. Manu's hands will go home where they belong. And, uh, people will forget. You know, they do, Cat. They always forget. Yes. Yes, I suppose you're right. And I certainly won't miss the American press such vultures. How would you like an island celebration this evening, Mrs. Bennett? Cad, you think we can swing it? We'll open up the terrace for a barbecue on the beach. Well, it might be slightly premature, don't you think? Wouldn't Friday be better? we draw a bigger crowd. Maybe Gerard could put an ad in his paper. Now you're using the old head. Here's the real brains of this outfit, Mrs. Bennett. I'll take a quick inventory and see what we need. Smile, lady. I'm a very nice fellow when you get to know me. You'll see. He's right, you know. Max is really a great guy once you get to know him. I'm sure he is. Where are you off to? Well, somebody should tell Bousquet about his son. I think I'd better go out to his place. Uh, I won't be around for lunch. I'm, I'm going off on another shopping spree. Uh, but when I get back... May I invite you to have dinner with me? I want to show you I can behave like a lady. Would you like to eat somewhere else? We don't have to stay here. Well, what do you recommend? I'm rather partial to the mini club in Marigold. The mini club it is, then. If you'll drive, uh, I'm even less reliable at the wheel after dark. <laughs> Maybe you'll keep me on as chauffeur. I work very cheaply. Any time. You could even take it up as a profession. <laughs> if you can drive some of our roads, you can drive anywhere. Adieu. Adieu. Cat, I can't find Alphonse. I'll have to do the marketing myself. Oh, I just spoke to Gerard. The ad's all set. I'm going out myself for a while. Uh, but I guess I can hang around. Oh, go on. Eloise can hold the port. I won't be long. I was frantic trying to find that man. With my eyesight and driving about, it took me well over an hour to locate Michel Bousquet. I went first to his house, just outside town, but he wasn't there. I didn't know where to look. It was just a lucky break that I ran into Leon DeLong, who was clearing brush nearby. He told me Michel Bousquet had gone to Point Blanche that morning. I finally tracked him down in the little fisherman's bar tucked beneath the pier. Apparently, he was unaware of what had gone on in the morning. Though my only clue to this was the pained expression that crept across his weather-beaten face when I told him his son might be charged with murder. He went off, poor man, to see if there was anything he could do. suggestion of black unrest had made my ears burn. Why hadn't the famous Annabelle Lee simply drowned it would have saved us all a lot of grief. Murder is such an ugly word, frightening. And suddenly with the investigation going on, everyone was tense, everyone a suspect. I waited for you, Sylvia, at the bar, drinking a no big thing, trying to relax, but it was useless. I wasn't even the least bit hungry. Alphonse reported for work while I was sitting there. He had news, but then Alphonse always had news. 
Mr. Khan, I find out who told the gendarmes about Guy Biscay. It was Rose Phillips. She told me. Rose Phillips. Why would she? Didn't you tell her Clemana Martin are not suspected? I tell her, yes. She tell anyway. My uncle Martin, he's in the hospital. What happened to Martin? Rose Phillips. Not Rose Phillips. Maria Lisa. She got him with a knife. The gendarmes, they do not know this because my uncle Martin tells the hospital he has an accident in his boat. Maria Lisa with a knife. But they love each other. Why in heaven's name would she... Lisa. Maria Lisa is a very jealous woman, Mr. Cad. Not of... Rose Phillips and your Uncle Martin? Long time ago. I think Maria Lisa is very nervous. Yes, we all are, but... Sorry, I'm late. I bought a new dress. I bring you fresh drinks. I'm fishing for a compliment. Mmm, you look smashing. I've never seen you wear your hair up that way. You've been hiding your beautiful neck all the time. Oh, thank you, kind sir. <laughs> I brought the papers. Two days old, of course. They're full of Annabelle Lee and Sir Martin. Sylvia, I don't want to even think about Annabelle Lee this evening. Thank you, Alphonse. Alphonse, are they bousquets back? Only madame and monsieur. But all is quiet now. So they're holding Guy. Here now, none of that. It's your house rule. You just made it. No Annabelle Lee. Let's get out of here. Wait, let me finish my drink. I'll tell Max we're leaving. Get another night off from school? I'll just let him know. We do as we please within reason. Oh, Cat, I was only teasing. Party on for Friday? I guess so. I didn't see Max all afternoon. He was whistling in the kitchen, though, just before we left. It should be all right by then, don't you think? Any sooner when it would be like a square dance before a hang Sometimes Max doesn't think things out. Take your next left there. Slow down. Hey, wait. What's going on? And something's up. Clear in, though. What's out this way other than... Other than Benavie knew nothing. Whatever is going on, it's going on there. Outside of Marigot, it's two-lane paved highway with very few curves. The money man had thought of everything, even straightening the access road. You piloted my little European car, Sylvia, like you'd raced them all your life. But even so, with the small engine, we lagged far behind the others. Even Boland, who came very close to driving into the sea twice, was merely two tiny red tail lights in the distance. When we got to the gate by the dirt construction road, it seemed the whole peninsula was lit up by the reflections of the glass of the whirling red beacons. There was a good deal of running around, remember? The entire police force was there. We were stopped at the gate. Thank God you're here. They won't let me in. Use some of your influence on these clowns, will you? Mr. Boland, you'll never learn. Well, what's that supposed to mean? Mr. Cadwallader, what are you doing here? Inspector Leclerc. Mrs. Bennett and I were about to have dinner in Marigold when we kind of got caught up in the traffic. What happened here? Perhaps you had better come with me. Hey, what about me? Just you, Mr. Cadwallader. Not the lady, I think. Now, look here. I'll I'll wait in the car. Just Monsieur Cadwallader. I demand you let me pass. I'm a member of the American press. But you are not on an American island. You better wait here, Boland, or you'll end up in jail yourself. The gendarmes take a dim view of interference. Please, Monsieur Cadwallader. Come now. I am afraid we have a new development. It's somewhat unpleasant one. Is Guy Bousquet here? Did he tell you to come here? You are very curious tonight, Monsieur Cadwallader. What you will see might make you wish you were not so curious. Captain Dubois, Dr. Fortier. What? Who? Who? Perhaps you cannot recognize him with his face in such a condition. His glasses were smashed to pieces. He is quite dead. How could anyone do such a thing? He was such a gentle man. Poor Gerard.
never forget your face when you came back to the house. It must have been an ordeal. Gerard's dead is all you said to me. You looked awful. All the color was gone from your face. But your voice. I heard anger. The fifth day. Word of Gerard's Gerard murder. murder. The second within five days spread havoc rapidly throughout our part of the island. A local had been slain, and the citizens reacted primarily in fear. My perpetual morning cup of coffee was brought to me by Eloise. Thank you, Eloise. What is it you look worried? The gendarmes have called a meeting. They want everyone in Grand Case, everyone except the children, to come at 3 o'clock this afternoon. They will open the schoolhouse for the meeting so that all can get in. I see. All right, thank you. Monsieur Cad, Alphonse said that Gerard Bonaventure has been killed. Is that true, Monsieur Cad? Yes, I'm afraid it is. Is there something else? Do you want to tell me something? He has, was just here a night ago. I just don't know, Monsieur Cad. He asked me a lot of questions. He did? Well, that wasn't unusual. Gerard asked everybody a lot of questions. That was his job. But the questions he asked me, they are about you, Monsieur Cad, and this house and everybody in it. Did he now? About me? What did he want to know about me? What you and Monsieur Max do in America, where you live, things like that. I say, Gerard, why do you want to know these things? And he say, I'm just curious, Eloise. We don't know very much about many of the aliens on the island. That's what he call you, aliens. And then he say, perhaps we should know more about them before we let them live here. Hmm. Well, please try not to worry, Eloise. You did the right thing. There's nothing we can do now. The gendarmes will find whoever killed Gerard, believe me. Everything will be all right. Oh, Eloise, have you seen Mrs. Bennett? She went to town. I hear her say she used up all her film and needs to get more. All right, thank you. Oh, wait. Where's Mr. Boland? He went somewhere, too, in Rose Phillips' car. I don't know where. Oh, okay, that's all. Thank you. I'll run along now. Try not to worry. Don't worry, I told her, Louise. Do as I say, not as I do. I was worried. Our population had been reduced by two. And the thought crossed my mind that perhaps more than one psychopath was running loose. But I decided there was more likely just one killer. It was Gerard's job to find out what really happened the night Annabelle Lee died. Perhaps he did. And was silenced by the only living person who knew. Just about anyone could have done it. In any case, I was worried. Eloise said that Gerard had been asking questions about me. If the real killer wasn't found, it could have gotten sticky for me. But that was a long shot, wasn't it, Sylvia? A man could go crazy worrying. Anyway, we were running a guest house, not a detective agency. I went to the kitchen to see if Max needed help. Got two free hands if you need them. Don't need them. Uh, you've, uh... Heard about the mass inquisition? Eloise told me. Cad, listen. I've been thinking. You haven't been off the island in years. Now, why don't you take some time off? A uh, vacation. Vacation? <laughs> what do you think this is, work? No, no, I mean it. No, I don't think a sudden trip would be a very wise thing to do on my part. Besides, until these murders are solved, the police will want us all to stick around. Someone hops a plane and bingo, there's your killer. And I didn't do it. Did you? Don't be funny. We didn't need this to happen. You said we had to play it by ear. Maybe we'd get lucky. For six years, we've had nothing but four-leaf clovers. Don't worry about it. I'm not. That's for sure. Gallivanting around with that Bennett woman when you know the place is crawling with... Just acting natural. Oh, natural hell. You haven't been seen with a woman since you got here. Max, I know this sounds foolish, but I believe you're jealous. Don't be a jerk. Relax. We'll just stay put. They'll find whoever did it, and then things will be back to normal. People will forget. They always forget. Isn't that what you told me? Sure they forget. Unless they're reminded by snooping fools who can't let things be. The priors and tattletales. The good liars of this godforsaken world. I didn't need more film. I needed to make a call. 
That morning, I phoned Carl from Phillipsburg. It was a bad connection. Carl, this is Sylvia. What have you done with the Joseph Johns info I sent you? Nothing, I hope, because there are new developments. You've got to hold it until I get back. Sylvia, I can't hear you. Where are you? Still in San Francisco? What's going on? Have they arrested John? No, no, they haven't arrested anybody. Carl, I found... I think I found that John's is innocent. There's a big town meeting this afternoon. I'm on my way there now, so don't set anything until I can... Don't love, it's already in. Front cover, too. It was a soft week, news-wise, so we blew it up. I've got a copy right here. Look, it's free. The stack should arrive there tomorrow. Oh, Carl. What? But what's the matter? Are you all right? Yes. I'm all right. I'm coming back tomorrow. I'll be on the first plane. What time? I'll send a car to pick you up. Don't bother, Carl. It's already too late. Tomorrow at this time, rest your eyes. And listen here to this week's continuing study in suspense. But I wouldn't want to die there. I'm Rod Serling, and this is The Zero Hour. You've been listening to the Hollywood Radio Theater's presentation of The Zero Hour. Heard every weekday at this time. Rod Serling is your host. Stanton Forbes, but I wouldn't want to die there, was adapted for radio by Kim Weisskopf. Nehemiah Persoff is Cat. Brock Peters is Leclerc. And Marge Redmond is Sylvia. Featured in the cast are William Woodson, Mady Norman, Jester Hairston, Alan Reed, and Herbert Rudley. Zero Hour is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Jack Myers is executive producer. Rochelle Sherman, associate producer. And Kim Weisskopf, story editor. Music conducted and composed by Stanley D. Hoffman. The Hollywood Radio Theater theme was played by Ferranti and Teicher and is now available on United Artists Records and Tapes. This has been a J.M. Colas Enterprises production. Hugh Douglas speaking. Tune in tomorrow and once again, rest your eyes and listen here to the Zero Hour. Hi, this is George Maharis. I'll be here next week as Carl Brooks on Hollywood Radio Theater's brand new Zero Hour. Carl Brooks is a framed man for a murder he did not commit. Or did he? You're out of your league, Sonny. What are you talking about? You think I killed him? Tell you what, just hand over the cash and I'll forget I saw you here. You can run and maybe you can beat the murder rap. Now, wait a minute, this is insane. Please listen to Craig Stevens, Charles McGraw, and me next week when the Zero Hour presents Dead Man's Tale.
this time, Monday through Friday, a J.M. Kohler's Enterprises production, the Hollywood Radio Theater presents an unusual tale of mystery and suspense. Every week, Monday through Friday, the Hollywood Radio Theater presents... I'm Rod Serling. You're listening to the Zero Hour. Rest your eyes. Exercise your mind. This week, Stanton for a flippant of tropical intrigue. But I wouldn't want to die there. Starring Nehemiah Prasov. Brock Peters. And Marge Redmond. In Elliot Lewis's production of... The Zero Hour. Have you ever wondered about the person tucked away in a corner of a toy factory, cutting jigsaw puzzles, taking a finished picture and cutting it up so someone can spend hours, weeks, piecing it back together, feeding the wood or pasteboard into the blade at any desired angle? I wondered about such a person. So, too, must Sylvia Bennett. The picture she thought she was making is suddenly many new pieces. More red in another corner. The blood of the island newspaper editor. She's no longer sure that the face she thought would be at the center will be there. And as she sits in her New York apartment, reading the letter, the instruction sheet, Sylvia Bennett has reason to believe this puzzle may have more pieces than she first expected. But I wouldn't want to die there. Continues after this word. That was some meeting. I remember. I made it back from Phillipsburg just in time. We were all crammed in. Everybody, Everybody seemed, seemed to be, to be at, at the schoolhouse school. that afternoon. Everyone from our place. Staff and guests, all the townspeople, visiting Americans, tourists, part-time residents, and Mr. Boland of the press. Even a few curious spectators from Marigold were there. All these people, and yet I could sense the void. Gerard belonged there. Captain Dubois, Inspector Leclerc, and Dr. Fortier sat at the main desk at the head of the class. Leclerc opened the proceedings. You are all aware of the recent death of Gerard Bonaventure. Yeah, we regret his passing and that of Madame Annabelle Lee. We are doing all we can to locate the person responsible for their untimely departure. Our belief is we are looking for one person. Perhaps present in this room. They began with me, which made sense. The whole terrible mess started where I began, with my evening walk along the beach. I don't know why I was nervous, but my legs were trembling as I gave my account. Wong and the men from the river substantiated my story. After that, the clerk called on Robert Tolliver, and things began to get lively. <laughs> Monsieur Tolliver? Would you inform us of your whereabouts the day of your wife's demise? San Juan, most of the day, on business. Flew back here for about an hour that afternoon, picked up a check for my wife, and flew back. <laughs> this business you speak of, the acquisition of Benvenu, was it satisfactorily completed? Not entirely. It's a very complicated procedure. Is it not strange that you did not take this check when you first left? Tankeray pulled a fast one. He wanted to bind her right then and there, a large amount of money. I was afraid he'd call the deal off if I didn't come up with it, so I flew back to get it. And your wife was alive and well? I told you, she wrote the check. When it comes back with my statement, I'll hand it to you. We have ascertained from Monsieur Tanqueray that there was such a check. Don't think we doubt that, Monsieur Tanqueray. Look, I can account for every second I was back here. I know what you're trying to pull, and I'm not going to let you get away with it. Tolliver got red in the face from all his shouting and had to be yanked down into his chair by his friend Bates. The clerk continued with Maria Lisa. She spoke very quietly, giving short answers. Annabel Lee was not a cold person, she said, a kind woman who kept to herself. She had no close friends in Grand Case and never entertained, though visitors dropped by from time to time. Tolliver was smoldering. Did you see him, Sylvia? I could tell it wouldn't be long before he blew. Max was just the one to set him off. Monsieur Terry, you were in San Juan that day, too. That's right. Your pension there has so agreed. 
Customs have verified both you and Mr. Tolliver as having boarded the same early flight, though not together. As a neighbor, tell me, how did you feel about Madame Lee? Well, I, uh, I felt sorry for her. She seemed such a lonely person, a big star, you know, probably most people were afraid to talk to her. Lonely, you say? And yet she had a husband. Well, it's common knowledge they didn't get along. That's a lie. There was a terrible bruise on her face one time, and she told me that he gave it to her. You're lying. That's what she said. She ran into a door. Yeah, the door at the end of your arm. Uh, Mr. Tolliver, please be seated. This is a farce. Look, we argued. Who's married that doesn't? She wasn't the easiest woman in the world to get along with, but I never hit her, never. I was on my way back to San Juan when it happened, and I can prove it. Alphonse Tabor. We have been told you spoke to Madame Lee at times. What can you tell us about her? Oh, she was nice to me, sir. She promised me a week for carnival. My uncle Martin did not like me to go there or Oliver either. He said she was a trouble lady. Hey, what about Uncle Martin? You said you thought she might have been in his boat. We have no evidence that she was. In addition, Martin Menard was in the hospital when Gerard Bonaventure was killed. All right, then. The other one. What's his name there? That space oh. cadet. Just the sort of mentality. Guy Bousquet was at the gendarmerie at the time of Gerard's death. Furthermore, after interrogation, we do not believe him capable of taking the lady out in a boat and ridding himself of the body without discovery. His mind is that of a child, and he is too public a figure in Grand Cape. But he spied on Annabelle. This he has admitted. He said he had never seen a lady without clothes. And so he was curious. And he liked what he saw. Oh, yeah, I, he 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 look at it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I love it. I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, he did it. Order. Order. I don't Order. 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 We go to the matter of the second murder. Dr. Fortier says Gerard Bonaventure was struck violently on the head before the noon hour yesterday. According to his secretary, Gerard left his office at 11 o'clock. On his way out, he left an advertisement for copying. That advertisement was for you, Monsieur Terry. We judge, therefore, that you talked to Gerard Bonaventure perhaps yesterday morning. Yes, I did. At what time was this? Oh, around uh, 10.30. Around? Uh, 10.30. I told him what we wanted the ad to say. He read it back to me and said, thanks. I, I was rushing off to the market. And that is where you went after the telephone conversation? Yes. Returning when? Oh, well, I guess close to one o'clock. The lunch crowd was coming in. We were very busy. Monsieur Cadwallader must have had his hands full serving such a crowd. No. Uh, no, no. Eloise and Therese were there alone. I'd gone looking for Michel Biscay. To tell him you'd taken Guy to my go. I went to his farm first, but he wasn't there. Then I ran into Leon Delong, who told me I might find Michel in Pointe Blanche. Did you find him? Yes, in the bar under the pier. At what time? Twelve, uh, twelve thirty maybe. It took me a while to find him. Michel Bousquet arrived at the gendarmerie at one fifteen. Allowing him a half hour to reach my go from Pointe Blanche... It would seem you saw Monsieur Bousquet after 12.30, Monsieur Cadwallader. That's possible. Why are you concentrating on us? What is this, a play? What are you trying to do? <laughs> Monsieur Terry, this is a public inquest. We are attempting to identify a pattern. We are not accusing anyone. Now, please sit down. Thank you. According to testimony, as you have heard it, Madame Lee left her house sometime in the afternoon. After her guests and maid had gone into Phillipsburg. After, her husband says, four o'clock. Where did she go? She told Gerard this. I heard her. See? Well, 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 Mademoiselle, you will tell us what she saw. Therese told me Madame Lee was walking on the beach toward Molly Smith Point. She was wearing a white bathing suit. What hour was this? Three o'clock. Three o'clock. She was certain. It had to be three o'clock. We'd go home at three thirty. She's lying. I don't know why, but she's lying. Wasn't Therese just a little curious to see where Madame Lee was going at three o'clock? Didn't she see her meet someone out by the point? Someone with a boat? No. She told me Madame Lee was walking by herself. If she left at three, she was back by four. Interesting, is it not? Why she was doing all that coming and going. Especially when she didn't anticipate your return, Monsieur Tolliver. 
Or did she expect you? Yes, she expected me. I called from the same one airport. And she must have been very weary from running home from the point. She must have run very fast because no one saw her come back, did they? Anyone? All right. When I got to the house, she wasn't there. She knew I was coming, but she wasn't around. You never saw her that afternoon? No. How did you get the check then? It was there on the desk under a paperweight. No note, nothing, just the check. All signed and ready. So I grabbed it, said to hell with her and left. And that's the God's truth. Why then did you lie to us? Why say Madame Lee was there when she was not? Oh, 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 yeah. Please, please. please. Monsieur Tolliver, we are waiting for your answer. I have a reason. I had a reason, a good one. The legal matter of the check. If she died before I got it, well, we're not sure it's good. Surely, Monsieur Tolliver, if it were not, your own funds would be more than sufficient to cover the amount. Of course, but my money's not so easy to get at. It's... it's tied up. It's all very complicated. I should say so. I know what you're thinking. I know how it looks, my being there, like she wouldn't give me the money, so I bopped her with a paperweight or something. But damn it, that's not what happened. I didn't kill her. I didn't lay eyes on her. I can prove I didn't, and you can't prove I did. Please, Monsieur Tolliver. Repeat to us your whereabouts on the morning of the second murder. You can't hear that on me. No way. Bates and I were at the airport arranging for shipment of my wife's body. I've got a dozen witnesses. Yes, so you have told us. That's the truth. Yes, we know. Nevertheless, it will be interesting to see your wife's check when it is returned. It is always so intriguing to examine the signature. The autograph, as it were, of a famous person. I don't like your attitude. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. We will let you know when we have anything further. This meeting is now adjourned. <laughs> I hate to say it, but uh, I'm afraid I should be leaving. I have things to attend to back home. Leave when? You don't mean right away. Yes, right away. Tomorrow. But Sylvia, you just got here. What's so important? Things. My apartment. You know, it's not a good idea to leave an apartment empty in New York for too long. If you do, it'll really be empty. We'll we stay back. until Saturday. Tomorrow night's the big barbecue. I think I'd better go. Don't make up your mind yet. Please, Sylvia. I don't get it. Why don't they arrest Oliver? Has he made some kind of deal with the government or what? They're waiting for something. Don't underestimate them, Max. In the meantime, he can't duck out. Do you think he killed him? Hell yes. Who else could it be? Tom, what do you think? I'm out of it. I'm not my brother's keeper. Oh, come on. Take a plunge, Cat. You won't drown. Why don't you ever get your feet wet, Cat? Perhaps because he's no fool. Cat, nice, Mr. Cat. The people in this village treat him like a minor deity. If he'd lift a finger, they'd come running to him and tell him everything they know or suspect. But will he lift that finger? No, not noble old cat. Who damn scared he might have to make a positive move against his fellow man. You're coming on a bit strong, Max, but you may be right, partly. What would you do if you knew who the murderer was? Well, I'll tell you what he'd do. He'd turn his back. That's what. He'd say, poor damn fool, and he'd go on pretending he didn't know, and then try to rid the hill and take the killer all by himself. A heart as big as his body. That's what Mr. Cadwallad has got. It makes me sick. I think I'll go lie down. No, stay. Max will go instead, won't you, Max? You've been drinking too much, haven't you, Max? And you say things you shouldn't when you're drinking, don't you? The lady is quite correct. I was just leaving. I bid you both. I'm sorry, Sylvia, for the way Max acted. It's this whole bloody business. Why do you take that from him? He's my best friend, my oldest friend. No, I'll amend that. He's my only friend. Et tu, Brute? No, you don't understand, and I could never tell you. Tell me what, Cat? Well, I owe Max a great deal. Just take my word for it. You really are a coward. You left out the fifth night. But I remember. We never even ate dinner. I guess we were pretty looped. It must have been late. The place was deserted. To memories. To old times. What's the first thing you remember? When you were a child, I mean. Oh, God, those are old times. The very first. Well, 
I must have been about three years old. That young. You must have been a very bright little girl. I remember it was Christmas, and I found a kitten in my stocking. Its head was peeping out of the top. I cried. I was so happy. Hmm. My first memory is seeing. Yes, my parents bought me glasses, and I put them on, and I climbed on a chair to look in the mirror. I didn't know whether to laugh because I could see myself so clearly or cry because I looked so ugly. I laughed. <laughs> They did, too. What happened to the kitten? Oh, still makes me sad. It got out in the driveway, and my father ran over it in his car. Oh, I'm sorry. So am I. Poor kitty. Never had the chance to grow up. Yeah, those are most unusual bracelets you wear. I noticed them the first day we met, remember? On the beach. I don't think I've seen you without them. They're really exquisite. Let me see them. Uh, no, Cat, please. No. Let... Now you know. They're cover-ups. You know, my eyes are so bad I couldn't see them. I felt the scars. Why did you do it? I was tired. Tired of no one caring. Your husband. I suppose so. Wow. Will it do any good to ask you not to try again? Huh? Well, remember, I asked. We walked up the stairs together. I felt so sorry. So ashamed. I knew what would happen the next day, and I knew I wouldn't be there. When I asked you into my room, Cad, you reacted so strangely. Were you shocked or pleased? I couldn't tell. I knew what I was doing, and yet, twenty-five years. It was Joseph Johns I opened my bed to, not you, Cad. We didn't say anything more that night, but but I know what you wanted to say, and I know what. <laughs> oh God! <sighs> Pull yourself together, Sylvia. No more jaded tears. You can only die once. <sighs> All right, Cad. Throw the switch. Squeeze the trigger. I have no last request. Tell me in your own words how I betrayed you. Just how was it for you when I left? It was the sixth day after I stumbled over the inert figure on the beach by Molly Smith Point. A day accentuated by a profound sense of loss. You, Sylvia, for reasons I would soon discover. Left without as much as saying goodbye. If you had, your words fell upon deaf ears. When I woke, you were gone. We on the island lowered Gerard into the ground that afternoon. I was in no mood for a party, but as host, I had my obligations. About the time the sun departed, our guests began arriving. For an hour or so, everything ran smoothly. Alphonse mixed, I served. Max and the girls brought out food, and everyone had a grand time. When people turned their attention to eating, I decided to take a walk. I just to think about things, be alone. Hey, whatever your name is, hold up! Man, did you ever have me fooled? What? What, what are you talking about? Yeah, read it and weep. Read what? I, I can't see out here. The new issue of day. Just look at the cover. He looked familiar. Is that me? I'll read it for you. It says, found Joseph Johns next door to murder. Looks like your lady friend fooled everyone. Who would have guessed? A dame. <laughs> hey, I got a cab waiting and a plane to catch. Thanks a lot for putting me up. Hey, look, I don't know if you did it, but I wish you all the luck in the world, Johns. You're going to need it. <laughs> Tomorrow at this time, rest your eyes and listen here. 
to this week's continuing study in suspense. But I wouldn't want to die there. I'm Rod Serling, and this is The Zero Hour. You've been listening to the Hollywood Radio Theater's presentation of The Zero Hour. Heard every weekday at this time. Rod Serling is your host. Stanton Forbes, But I Wouldn't Want to Die There, was adapted for radio by Kim Weisskopf. Nehemiah Persoff is Cat. Brock Peters is Leclerc. And Marge Redman is Sylvia. Featured in the cast are Owen Soleil, Alan Reed, Jester Heston, Lady Norman, and William Woodson. Zero Hour is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Jack Myers is executive producer. Rochelle Sherman, associate producer, and Kim Weisskopf, story editor. Music conducted and composed by Stanley D. Hoffman. The Hollywood Radio Theater theme was played by Ferranti and Teicher and is now available on United Artists Records and Tapes. This has been a J.M. Colas Enterprises production. Hugh Douglas speaking. Tune in tomorrow and once again, rest your eyes and listen here to The Zero Hour.
the Hollywood Radio Theater. Every day at this time, Monday through Friday, a J.M. Colas Enterprises production, the Hollywood Radio Theater presents an unusual tale of mystery and suspense. Every week, Monday through Friday, the Hollywood Radio Theater presents... I'm Rod Serling. You're listening to the Zero Hour. Rest your eyes. Exercise your... This week, standing for a flippant of... But I wouldn't want to die there. Starring Nehemiah Prusa. Brock Peters. And Marge Redmond. In Elliot Lewis's production of... The Zero Hour. This week, we've been working on a puzzle. We began with a letter sent to a woman about to commit suicide. A letter that told of a murder. A puzzle, then. The identity of a killer. Help arrived, but only got in the way. Pieces stuck together. Others didn't seem to fit at all. A patternless puzzle. Then a second murder. More pieces. Not another puzzle entirely, but one within the other, like concentric circles with rough edges. Now we've but a few pieces remaining, but as yet no picture. For Sylvia Bennett and for you, the last pages of the letter contain the pieces that fill in the gaps. Listen carefully. But I wouldn't want to die there. Falls into place after this word. The meaning of what Boland said took a few moments to set in. I half jogged back up the beach and unlocked the door outside the back steps that lead upstairs. We hadn't used them since our first year on the island, but I still remembered the combination. Three, thirty-one, twenty. The miserable day I was born. It seemed like an eternity going up the old stairs. It was a miracle they held up under my weight. I locked the door to my room behind me and turned on a strong light. The caricature on the magazine cover was not flattering. See page twenty. Whatever Happened to Joseph Johns by... by Sylvia Bennett. He's a heavy-set man. Man wearing thick glasses for congenital myopia. His expression is benign. His voice is gentle. He lives by a dead man's name, Jeffrey S. Cadwallader. But his real name is Joseph Johns. And 25 years ago, he was convicted of murder and sent to prison. He resides in the village of Grand Case on the Caribbean island of Saint-Martin where actress Annabelle Lee met death last week at the hands of a person or persons unknown, as of this writing. Joseph Johns, alias Cadwallader, lives in a second-floor apartment of the guest house he owns. On that same floor lives his friend and partner, Maxwell Terry, brother of the late Helen Terry. It was she who was killed 25 years ago. Helen Terry, then aged 14, murdered, according to the decision of judge and jury, by Joseph Johns. <laughs> I felt suddenly sick all over, just like when I saw Gerard laying dead on the floor that night. I turned the pages, and there I was, smiling brightly in living color. The photographs you took that day at Benevenu, sightseeing. And one of Helen, poor little Helen, only a child. Yes, a kitten who never got the chance to grow up. Hey, Claire! What are you doing in there? Open up. Have you seen Boland? Yeah, yeah, I saw him leave. What's with Boland? He brought me a present. Take a look. I knew there was something wrong with that woman. So you're right as usual. I should have known. What would she see in someone like me? Boy, she really dug it all up. I, uh, I better get back downstairs. The both of us gone could really look bad. What can I do? Stay here. 
If anyone asks, I'll say you're not feeling well. The moment I locked the door behind Max, I began feeling my release. I didn't know what to take or where I might be going. All I could fit in was one suit of clothes, a toothbrush razor, and lens cleaner. I almost packed my sleeping pills, but at the last moment, reconsidered and left the vial on the desk. I took one to calm my nerves. I thought about destroying the magazine, but by morning, there would be copies all over the island anyway. So to pass the time, I read. It was nearly three o'clock when I heard the door. Cat, it's me, Max. I got it all worked out. It'll take a little time. How much time have we got? Enough. Now listen carefully. I know a guy with a boat who owes me a favor. For the right price, he'll get you off Saint Martin. Now turn out the light. One of Leclerc's men is hanging out across the street. I don't want him to see me leave. Leave? Where are you going? Out to make arrangements with Hippolyte, the guy with the boat. All right, Max, go down the back steps. I opened the door and didn't put the lock back. Good. Max! I really don't understand why you're such a good friend. I never have understood. <laughs> it's very simple, Cam. I've always known you didn't push Helen off that roof. You'd never have had the guts. I heard the station wagon pull away and listened for a car to follow, but none did. Max had managed to slip away. In the bureau drawer, I found the whiskey I kept for, uh, well, bitter nights, and I took a long swallow from the bottle. Then I waited. I must have dozed off because I didn't hear anyone come up the stairs, but somebody was knocking quietly at the door. Mr. Carr, it's Alphonse. I got to talk to you, Mr. Carr. Let me in, please. Mr. Carr, you come with me. Alphonse, what are you... My brother Oliver has something to tell you. Something he's seen. Something he's seen? Yes, yes, he will tell you. He has a way. He says, bring you. He says, you are kind to him. You smile to him, you wave to him. Come with me now, please. The house was dark when we got there. Someone, Alfonso's mother, I think, lit a kerosene lamp when we got inside. When my eyes adjusted to the light, I could see blankets tacked over the windows so no one could see in. Oliver was there. And Therese, and Eloise, and Michel Bousquet. Monsieur Card. Hello, Mrs. Tabor, friends. The tourist, Bolland, has been making trouble for you. You know, then. We do not believe what he says. We have been thinking what to do about it. And as we talk, we find Oliver here knows something he has not told. What is it? Tell Mr. Card now, Oliver. The, the sun? Or oh, a hill? A point? Molly Smith Point. Oh, you were on Molly Smith Point when Annabelle... Le what is he saying now? He was gathering firewood for the kitchen stove. Yes, go, go on, Oliver. Uh, 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 a boat? Who? Who was in the, the boat? Did you see? Did you, did you, did you recognize? L oh, a long face. Uh, a beard? A man... Max... No, no, there must be some mistake. M Max was in Puerto Rico. I took him to the airport myself the day before. He says he makes no mistakes. They didn't see him, but he saw them. Not Max. No, why, why anyone else, but... We know how you feel, Mr. Card. He is your friend. No, I can't believe it. But then I had... To believe it. At that very moment, Max was out arranging for my escape with a man in a boat who owed him a favor. He could have killed Annabel Lee by accident. Maybe just lost his temper and hit her once. But no, no, I saw her. It was more than once. And Gerard, too, but why? How could Gerard have known? Only if he discovered Max hadn't really gone to San Juan. The ticket manager at the airport, that same man I had seen hustling out of Leclerc's office, uh, Emmanuel Patterson. I had to hear it from him. I told you, I, I don't know any Max Terry. 
A week ago, yesterday, the early flight to San Juan, a full load, remember, Emmanuel. I am the new ticket manager. That was my first day. Yes, but there was a line at your ticket counter, Emmanuel. A woman with a dog in a crate. And Robert Tolliver, who gave you a rather hard time, as I recall. And then there was a fellow with a beard. Uh, a beard? Yes, Max Terry. I, I see lots of people. I have a very important job. I, I see lots of people with beards. Yes, but this bearded man, he bought a ticket from you. He checked through customs and then came back to me and said he was going to get coffee. You remember the flight was delayed and there was no use in me hanging around? Hmm? I, I don't remember what you say. I'm sure you recall checking the passenger list. That... Look, don't you remember, Emmanuel? I'm certain you do. You lied to the gendarmes. You told them Max Terry was on that flight. I didn't lie. They asked to see my passenger list. They asked me, did these two men buy tickets to San Juan? I said, yes. Yes, but you know one of them didn't go. You don't call that lying? I didn't know who didn't go. It could have been anyone. That's another lie. You must have known about the murder. So you were afraid to tell the truth. Huh? You were afraid to say that Max Terry didn't fly to San Juan. But you didn't lie to Gerard, did you, Emmanuel? No. I, I told Gerard. He was my friend. He said not to worry. He would see I didn't get in trouble. I, I didn't know if it was my first day. You don't know how hard it is for an island man to get a good job. And then when Gerard... Thank you, Emmanuel. I'm sorry it turned out like it did. It's almost over now. Don't worry. Your job is safe. And Emmanuel... Thank you for the truth. I must have been exhausted. What with the sleeping pill and all the excitement, when I woke up, I was sitting in the chair. I heard the door close behind me. Everything's set. Hippolyte's got the boat in the bay. Uh, you'll have to wait out to meet him. You ready? No, Max, I'm not. What do you mean? I'm not ready because I'm not going. You are, Max. Me? <laughs> Why should I go? Max, there was a witness. Someone saw you meet Annabelle Lee by Molly Smith Point. Why, Max? Why didn't you get on that plane? Patterson, huh? He told you. Man. Not Patterson. Don't ask me to tell you who saw you because I won't. And if you don't get in that boat with Hippolyta and go, I'll take my eyewitness and pay a visit to Leclerc. You'd tell the gendarmes after all I've done for you? If you leave me no other choice, I'm no martyr. <laughs> I thought you were in the beginning. Then I found out you were just blind and dumb. What do you mean by that? I mean I picked you out all those years ago. Joseph Johns, Mr. Nice Guy. Mr. Fat, Rich, Nice Guy. All those speeches about how you were like a brother to me, you ate it up like candy. A ten-cent sucker. Max... Where were you the morning that Helen died? I was down at the docks, don't you remember? Where were you really? Well, now, if we're going to play 20 questions, I need a drink. There's a bottle over at the bureau. Help yourself. You know, Max, I heard Helen scream. I can still hear it. She was gone by the time I reached the roof. No one was up there. But somebody could have been hiding. There was a chimney. I wouldn't have known. My glasses were much weaker. You looked right at me, I thought. You really didn't see me, did you? All the time you were in prison, I thought you were taking the rap for me. I went up there to do in one of old Lady Frederica's pigeons, and I did too. Wrung its neck. But Helen saw me. She was going to tell, so I shoved her. She fell off. Well, that was bad luck. It was an accident. Yeah, but when I showed up, your luck changed. Oh, you were so perfect. Always hanging around. You're a very dangerous man, Max. <laughs> dangerous? This temper of yours, it's not safe to let you run around loose. It's probably mental. <laughs> he thinks I'm crazy, and I think he's crazy. Hey. Could I have one of those pills there? I got a headache like to split my brain. Go ahead. Thanks, old buddy. You'd do anything for old Max, wouldn't you? 
Wouldn't you? Oh, buddy. It was the saddest night of my life listening to Max's confession, watching him destroy himself. But I did what I felt was fair. It was his choice. The more drunk he got, the more resigned he became to his fate. He blamed all the people who made things easy for him. His parents, Helen, Anita, Hippolyta, me, even the real Cadwallader, who he said took the bullet in Korea that was meant for him. But in the end, he did place the real blame squarely upon his own shoulders. It was high noon when Eloise found us sitting there, me with my eyes open, Max with his eyes closed. Mr. Cadwallader, the gendarmes are downstairs. Tell them to come up, Eloise. And send someone for a doctor. I think Mr. Max has committed suicide. He drank a whole fifth of whiskey with a bottle of sleeping pills. I'm afraid he's quite dead. We buried Max in the cemetery down the slope from where Gerard lay. The gendarmes were pretty decent about it. Patterson told his story. They finally got some straight facts out of Anita in San Juan. And Oliver and I told ours. The magazine story caused no scandal on the island to speak of, and the New York police chose not to initiate extradition proceedings. Perhaps the parole board felt it would be more trouble than it was worth. I had planned to visit New York City and a woman writer who might have been a friend, only I never went. I can never leave Saint Martin because they would turn me back at San Juan or arrest me. They would say there was no such person as Jeffrey Stamp Cadwallader. They would say he was dead. Hello? Hello, Carl? Sylvia, I've been trying to reach you all day and night. Honey, I'm sorry about this morning. Let's have coffee. Oh, I haven't got the time. Something wonderful has happened. That's great. I'm glad to hear it. Can you tell me? Uh, there's a letter here. It'll explain everything. I'm leaving town for a while. Oh, it's something I should have done a while ago, only I didn't have the guts. Uh, you're not off chasing rainbows, I hope. I'm leaving the letter on the desk. I'll write to you at the office. Take care. Goodbye. I'd like to make a reservation for one on your next flight to San Martin. Uh, the last name's Bennett. That's B. Perhaps it is a woman's prerogative to change her mind. Sylvia Bennett, a woman intent on committing suicide, found something, someone to live for. But for Carl Towers, life on Madison Avenue goes on unaltered. It's February, one month after the call from his former wife, informing him of her latest change of heart. Miss Jenks? Has Keller's copy on the summit talks come in? No, sir, it hasn't. Well, get him at home and tell him I said if that copy's not here by noon, he'll never write another word for any magazine. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Towers, a telegram just came for you. Shall I bring it in? No, read it to me. Well? I, uh... uh it, it says, uh, Sylvia Bennett committed suicide last night. Drowned. Can't express anguish. Plan to bury her on island. Wish it had been me. It's signed Jeffrey Stamp Cadwallader. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Towers. <sighs> Cancel all meetings for the day, Miss Jenks. I uh, don't want to be disturbed for any reason. Damn it! You finally did it. Why, Sylvia? Why now? Miss Jenks, I said I, I don't... I know, Mr. Towers, but this special delivery letter... I it? don't care. It's from your wife, sir. Oh. Uh, all right. Uh, leave it here. Postmark February 12th. Yesterday. Must be Sylvia's last letter. Pictures, too. Carl, hurriedly, Cat has asked me to marry him. I said I would. But then, early this week in the guest house office, I found his personal checkbook. I wouldn't have looked into it, but I didn't know what it was. I'm frightened, Carl. I'm frightened for my life. I'm sending you photographs of several check stubs I found. Please hold on to them. I'm afraid Cat has lied to me. Everything was a lie. The way he said Max set him up, everything he told me was a lie. It wasn't Max. It was never Max. 
Oh, Carl, I'm so frightened. Please come. Help me, Carl. Please help me. Sylvia. Check stubs. Pictures of checks. Pay to the order of Oliver Taylor, Newton School, $250. Pay to the order of Emmanuel Patterson, Carib Airways, $200. Oliver Taylor again. Need a Castellano, Primavera Hotel, San Juan. Apology Mercier. I need a Castellano. Everything was a lie. Help me. A plane, Miss Jenks. I want to be on the next flight to San Martin. I don't care how you do it, but get me on that plane. That concludes this week's production of The Zero Hour. Stanton Forbes, but I wouldn't want to die there. Next week, we'll begin another exciting dramatization of a tale of mystery and suspense. We'll tell our story in five days, at the same time Monday through Friday. So on Monday, rest your eyes and listen here to the Zero Hour. You've been listening to the Hollywood Radio Theater's presentation of The Zero Hour. Heard every weekday at this time. Rod Sterling is your host. Stanton Forbes, but I wouldn't want to die there, was adapted for radio by Tim Weisskopf. Nehemiah Persoff was Cad. Brock Peters was Leclerc. And Marge Redman was Sylvia. Featured in the cast were Alan Reed, Nady Norman, Jester Hairston, Kim Hamilton, Herb Jefferson, Herbert Rudley, and Kay Stewart. Zero Hour is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Jack Myers is executive producer. Rochelle Sherman, associate producer. And Kim Weisskopf, story editor. Music conducted and composed by Stanley D. Hoffman. The Hollywood Radio Theater theme was played by Ferranti and Teicher and is now available on United Artists Records and Tapes. This has been a J.M. Colas Enterprises production. Hugh Douglas speaking. Tune in Monday and once again, rest your eyes and listen here to The Zero Hour. Thank you.